Hello everyone, this is David Schwartz. Uh, I gave a talk recently at Stanford called The Best Incentive is No Incentive, and I kind of ran out of time a little bit, and I wanted to give that talk kind of over again, uh, being able to give more detail, so uh, here we go. I did give two warnings when I gave that talk. Uh, one of them was I kind of jokingly warned any Bitcoin maxis that may have stumbled in that they may find the content triggering. That was kind of a joke. The other one that wasn't really a warning um, I pointed out that this was a talk that I wanted to give many years ago um, in 2012 when we made a lot of the decisions that I'm going to talk about today. There would have been no place to give the talk and nobody to give it to, and I would have had to explain to everybody what I was talking about. Uh, obviously, some content has been updated, but these are things that I've wanted to be able to share for a very long time, and it's great to get that opportunity. Um, so what's the problem? Um, what, what are... What are incentives for? What role do they play? And the answer is that eventual consistency is needed for blockchains to be useful. Um, essentially, the double spend problem. If Alice is going to send the Bitcoin to Bob, at some point, Bob has to know that everybody will agree that he's received that Bitcoin, and he can send Alice a phone or a book or whatever it is that Alice is paying for. There, there needs to be some point at which you can rely on the transaction being accepted. Otherwise, uh, the system is useless. Now, you might think that you don't need incentives. You might think that some of the other properties of blockchains are sufficient to guarantee what you need. Uh, and in particular, three properties that blockchains have is that all system state is public, all nodes know which transactions are valid, and all nodes know what a transaction does. So you don't need to ask another node what the state of the system is. Uh, it can be proven to you. You don't need to ask another state which transactions are valid. You know the rules for transaction validity. And you don't need anyone else to tell you what a transaction does. Everybody knows the rules that apply to all transactions. Uh, this is almost enough to solve the problem. But it's not enough to solve the problem because a useful blockchain can have more than one way to make valid forward progress. So if Alice has a Bitcoin, she can send it to Bob or she can send it to Charlie. And by all of the rules, both of those transactions will be valid. She'll have a Bitcoin, so the public system state will say that she can send it to Bob or Charlie. All nodes will know that both transactions are valid. Um, and all nodes will know that the result of one transaction is that Bitcoin goes to Bob, and the result of the other transaction is that Bitcoin goes to Charlie. So those rules are not enough to decide between which of two ways to make valid forward progress. Uh, and I want to point out one thing, which is that we only really care about honest participants here. The only extent to which we care about dishonest participants is the extent to which they can confuse honest participants. So for example, I can make my Bitcoin software say that I have a trillion Bitcoins if I want. If I can't convince other people that I have a trillion Bitcoins, it doesn't matter. I can lie to myself. When you accept Bitcoins as payment, what you care about is that honest people will accept that, bit, that that payment has taken place. You don't care what dishonest people do, except to the extent that they can confuse honest people. If, there are, if you're interacting with dishonest people, they'll just lie about anything. I mean, there's nothing that the system can do to force dishonest people to be honest. So um, we don't. So we, we only need uh, incentives when there's more than one way to make valid forward progress that's sort of equally good. They both comply with the rules, and we need some eventual agreement. If half the world thought that the Bitcoin went to Bob and half the world thought the Bitcoin went to Alice, if uh, Bob shipped a book or Alice shipped a phone or both in exchange for that Bitcoin transaction, they would be upset when they were not able to send that Bitcoin to exchanges or to other people who might want it. I'm going to use the term stakeholder a lot, and what I mean by a stakeholder is someone who gets value out of a system, someone who has a problem that the system solves, and someone who has an interest in seeing the system continue to function. So for example, if we were talking about eBay, the stakeholders would be people who want to buy, people who want to sell, and then eBay itself. Um, if, if we're talking about Bitcoin, the stakeholders are people who want to sort of have a store of value, people who want to have a means of exchange, and then the miners who want to make money. Um, by natural stakeholders, I mean the people who have like the core problem that the system's designed to solve. I mean, there's a, in a sense in which eBay solves a problem for sort of eBay stockholders, but you wouldn't describe eBay as like, well, we needed a way to make money, and eBay sort of solves that problem for us, the owners of eBay. You would say, you know, people need to buy and sell. There's friction in that. eBay reduces friction. Buyers and sellers are willing to pay fees to have that friction reduced, and so on. And so in the case of Bitcoin, the natural stakeholders are the people who want a means of exchange or store of value. And, and that can be different in different blockchains.
Um, by a forced stakeholder or an artificial stakeholder, I mean stakeholders who are needed for the system to work. And they only bring value because the system's design requires them. Forced stakeholders extract value from the system and represent remaining friction. So if you're a buyer or a seller on eBay, you want the system to work, but you don't want eBay to take so much money because that money is coming from you. And similarly, the miners in Bitcoin are taking money when they produce Bitcoins and sell them. That money has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the people who find value in the system. And they represent residual friction. If you're someone who's using Bitcoin, you would like the transaction fees to be as low as they can for the level of security that you need. So you need the system to work. Like if I'm trading on eBay, I need eBay to be able to process payments and to stay in business and operate servers. And if I'm on Bit using Bitcoin. I need Bitcoin to be secure and I need Bitcoin transactions to work, but I want that level of function for as little as I have to pay for it because I'm the one who's paying for that. I want the highest level of security and functionality for the lowest fee as a natural stakeholder. And importantly, the four stakeholders want to be able to extract as much value from the natural stakeholders as they can. So if you're eBay, you want to be able to raise the fees as high as people are willing to pay. And if you're a miner, you want the block reward and the transaction fees to be as high as they can be, provided you keep the system them useful for the natural stakeholders because if the natural stakeholders go away, there's no money left for the forced stakeholders. eBay itself is a forced stakeholder. Miners are forced stakeholders. The natural stakeholders prefer as little value go to them as possible because they're paying that value. Uh, we hear a lot about decentralization, but I want to talk specifically about operational decentralization, which is sort of a reasonable assurance of inherent fairness. Operational decentralization is insurance that the system operates fairly in the short to medium term, and it sort of excludes long-term concerns. So in the context of a system like Bitcoin, by operational decentralization, I mean I can submit a transaction to Bitcoin, and it's going to work. Um, and it won't not work because somebody in the system doesn't like me. In the case of eBay, there is no operational decentralization. Transactions can be sort of arbitrarily uh, disabled or prevented. There, there is no operational decentralization in something like eBay. But in something in Bitcoin, there is. When you interact with Bitcoin, you can have a reasonable assurance that the system will treat you fairly. It won't, in some sense, be biased against you. That's not the same as governance. Governance operates over longer time frames. And for systems that have operational decentralization, governance maintains that operational decentralization. So for example, if something threatened the operational decentralization of Bitcoin, uh, let's say a whole bunch of miners got together and started to censor transactions, let's say, then governance could kick in to change those rules. Like in, in a worst case scenario, you could imagine like the mining algorithm being changed. Not likely to happen, but that would be the role of governance. Governance can also also stave off technological obsolescence. It can coordinate longer changes like Bitcoin Cash and large Bitcoin's block size, Bitcoin, ca uh, Bitcoin uh, added uh, segregated witness, and similarly, governance can make those sort of larger changes that stave off technological obsolescence. And there is some interaction between the sort of short-term operational decentralization and governance. Like, for example, in any governance change in Bitcoin, you would expect the miners to have a role because they are currently the way that provides its operational decentralization. Uh, and I just need to sort of put a caveat that this is about what stakeholders can actually expect. What can you reasonably expect in the future? Uh, will you continue to get what you want? Because uh, the reason I point this out is sometimes someone will make an argument like there'll never be more than one twenty more than twenty one million bitcoins, like by definition, and like if the rules change so that there's more, it's not Bitcoin anymore. If you're a stakeholder of the system, that doesn't matter. If there was a rule change to keep the block reward at you know five bitcoins forever. The fact that you could form a separate network in which there were still only 21 Bitcoins or that you think people are wrong in calling the new system Bitcoin doesn't help you. Like the value of your bit, you're, you're effectively having to interact with that system with the different governance rules. Uh, and similarly, like if you didn't want either segregated witness or larger blocks in Bitcoin, well, you, you didn't get a choice. Um, I, I hope that you would pick systems where the governance is likely to evolve the system in the directions that you want. There were people who wanted bigger blocks, they got them. There were people who wanted segregated witness and they got them. But if you didn't want those things, you have to live with them, even if they impose costs on you, even if they create security issues for you or whatever. You, as a practical matter, you have to go with the direction that the system goes. You always have the ability to split the system, the, the system off, but that has costs as well as benefits. And of course, if the benefits outweigh the cost, then you should split off. So let's talk about proof of work, the first incentive system and the first way of providing operational decentralization in a blockchain system. It's expensive. 
Security comes from the cost to sort of replicate the chain, and honest participants have to actually pay those costs. In other words, every bit of mining that occurs on the Bitcoin blockchain, someone's paying for it. And ultimately, that's coming from the natural stakeholders, which means money is leaving the system. The Bitcoin blockchain is putting a lot of money in the hands of electric companies and ASIC manufacturers. That money came from the Bitcoin ecosystem. It came from natural stakeholders who held Bitcoin because they wanted to store a value, a means of exchange. They wanted to speculate on its value. And importantly, if the means of paying for proof of work loses value, the system can lose security. So it intimately connects the system's security with its economic value. An interesting corollary of that is that systems that don't have high economic value can't be secured with proof of work. And systems have to continue to sort of run very quickly just to stay in place. Bitcoin has to generate enough value to pay for millions of dollars worth of proof of work every day just to maintain the ability to, security, to securely move value around. Um, and then there's the risk of a double spend attack. So there's a financial incentive to attack the system. If you have a lot of the mining power, you can do a double spend attack. You can send currency to an exchange, and then you can sort of erase that transaction. Um, and it's not clear how you recover from a double spend attack. The only thing you can really do is you can sort of change the mining algorithm, but that bankrupts the honest miners. So if you didn't have enough honest miners to begin with, it's hard to imagine that you would have enough honest miners after you bankrupt most of the honest miners. Uh, irrational markets don't seem to care very much about double spend attacks, but stakeholders do. So if you want real use, you want a real application, you should care about double spend attacks. Um, so Bitcoin, for practical purposes, seems pretty safe from a double spend attack, barring you know some sort of massive conspiracy, which doesn't seem very likely. But uh, it's very difficult to make additional systems safe from these types of attacks. The advantage of proof of work is it can do the initial distribution of a currency and nothing else really can. Uh, you can argue proof of stake can sort of distribute a new currency and sort of like block producer rewards can, but there what you're basically doing is you're inflating the currency and that isn't really distribution, that's just maintaining the existing distribution. I would argue there's no other advantage of proof of work. It's hard to imagine a security model worse than the honest people have to actually pay more than the dishonest people are willing to pay. Like, if I have to buy a new TV set every week to keep my TV set secure, that like, could you imagine a worse security model than like having to pay for the, every bit of value that you get? Like, the point of security is sort of to protect the value without you having to sort of give it up all the time. So it has probably the worst security return in terms of cost-benefit analysis. And miners are, stake are forced stakeholders. The only value miners bring is allowing the system to function. The system's value comes from its natural stakeholders. You couldn't just have miners in the system. The value of the token would collapse, and so the proof of work would go away, and the system would stop being secure. And natural stakeholders have to act through miners. Miners get an important role in governance because they're so important to the operational decentralization. And the reason that's a problem is that miners and uh, natural stakeholders have only partially aligned incentives. So they both want the system to work. They both want the system to have high value, but miners want high fees and uh, because they're reaping the benefit of those fees, and the natural stakeholders want low fees because they're paying them. So there is the there is a limited alignment, uh, but it seems to work. I, I, you know, no discussion of proof of work would be complete without pointing out that Bitcoin has been tremendously successful. So uh, it works. But it relies on the system's native value. So there has to be a native token to pay miners with, and the system's security is directly tied to the value of the token. The system will lose value if it can't keep producing enough to pay for its security, and natural stakeholders will have to keep bringing this value from somewhere. So it, it's fragile. Uh, and it does force a race to the bottom. I think this is important given the recent attacks on Ethereum's DeFi ecosystem. Uh, if you're a miner, you have to cut costs or you lose. You can't buy the most reliable hardware. You can't buy the most, uh, the, the nicest equipment, high-end stuff, because you'll be outcompeted by people who, you know, who. if you're down 5% of the time but it saves 6%, you need to do that. And you have to be evil or, if you, or you lose. So imagine you're mining Ethereum and someone else is gaming the DeFi ecosystem. If they're making 5% more than you, they're going to put you out of business because they're going to be able to operate. They're going to be expanding their mining hardware. They're going to be pushing up the difficulty, reducing your return. So if there's some way you can make more money when you mine, if somebody does it, everyone has to do it. And so you get this race to the bottom. And there's no incentive to improve the network, really. There's a sort of diffuse incentive that everybody wants the network to be better, but there's no direct incentive. Miners are, are mercenaries. Um, they, they can switch. They can switch uh, depending on uh, ASIC requirements. They may be able to switch blockchains, but they're not really 
interested in the long-term growth of the network, except insofar as like they're making money from mining it. It's not solving a real problem for them. And the natural stakeholders want as few miners as possible to get whatever level of security they need. Obviously, they want a level of security sufficient for their applications, but having lots and lots of miners beyond the required security is just additional cost. And it doesn't really operationally decentralize by itself. Um, the people who are going to mine are going to look very similar. They're going to pe be the people who have the cheapest power. They're going to be the people who have the best ASICs or whatever hardware is required. They have to be able to operate cheaply. And people who have those same characteristics are going to be similar. They tend to mostly be in China. They tend to mostly be companies of certain sizes and so on. And miners choose how the system makes forward progress. The way proof of work is designed, um, it, it's, it's, what does, it's what protects the operational decentralization. Uh, a newer technique, staking and slashing, uh, is uh, an alternative to proof of work. It's being considered by Ethereum and used by some other blockchains. Um, stakers lock up a volatile asset, and they risk loss of the asset if they mess up. But the important thing to understand is um, if you're asking somebody to lock up a volatile asset and they're risking losing it if they make some sort of technical mistake, they're going to have to make a lot of money to justify being willing to lock up a volatile asset and incur that risk of loss. So it's going to be cheaper, but it is not going to be significantly cheaper. And you have the same problem with proof of work with the native asset. There has to be a native asset that can be staked and slashed, and security is going to be tied to the value of that asset. So it's not going to be useful for systems that have a lot of value in non-native assets. And I would add, Ethereum is moving that, of that direction. Ethereum has a lot of value in ERC-20 tokens that don't, can't really be staked and slashed at Ethereum's core level. That doesn't really make sense. So it's going to be interesting to see um, how that plays out. It's also perfectly competitive. There's the same race to the bottom, who can stake and slash at the lowest price. Same decentralization problem. People who can afford to stake and risk slashing at minimum risk are going to be, can look similar. It's tax inefficient in many jurisdictions. You have to keep running to stay in place because the rewards are income. Uh, stakers are taxing, solving the stakeholder's problem, and stakeholders should be solving their own problems. Like the promise of blockchain was sort of be your own bank, and like having somebody else who's taxing you to solve your problems is not what blockchain was supposed to be about. So there are a lot of problems with incentives. We begin with incentives tax natural stakeholders. With proof of work, stakeholders have to actually pay more than attackers are willing to pay, which, as I said, is possibly the worst imaginable security model. It forces that race to the bottom. It adds forced stakeholders, and it creates misalignment. Um, the people who are uh, reaping rewards want the rewards to be as large as possible. The people who are paying them want them to be as small as possible. So that is, that is misalignment. That's friction that the system is not going to get rid of. But there is natural alignment, and that natural alignment can be exploited. Uh, to begin with, natural stakeholders are aligned. They all have a problem the system can solve. They all want a solution. They want a system that works. They want a system that's reliable. And they want operational decentralization because they believe that adds value. So natural stakeholders are already aligned. And they want low fees. The paradox of incentives is that high fees create the need for high incentives and vice versa. So if you have expensive proof of work, you have to be generating a lot of value to pay for that proof of work, which means you need high fees. And if you're giving out high fees, that means you need a lot of proof of work. People will produce a lot of proof of work to compete for those high fees. Um, you can spin that cycle in reverse. You can have low fees, which require low incentives. That cycle can be spun either way. Natural stakeholders want that cycle broken. And again, you have natural incentives. Everybody who's using the system is aligned in wanting the system to function and be cheap. Uh, and so that's what we did in the design of the XRP ledger back in 2012. Um, you do need something scarce. Uh, malicious adversaries can refuse to participate in the ordering process. So let me back up for a second. Um, since we all know the state of the system, we all know which transactions are valid, we all know what transactions do, to solve the double spend problem, all we need is to agree on putting transactions in order. That, that's all we need to do. Uh, malicious adversaries can just refuse to participate in the ordering process. That's it. That's the only way that they can cause a problem. It's not that difficult to come to a consensus on, on how to order transactions. You basically just sort them. Um, tr every transaction can be represented by a number, and everybody agrees on which numbers are bigger or smaller than which other numbers. Um, it's not that difficult. The biggest problem is that malicious adversaries will refuse to participate in the ordering process or will create thousands of um, participants in the ordering process that just essentially create noise. If I walk into a room full of 1,000 people and I say, hey, I'll give you each $100 if you agree on a number between 1 and 100, someone just goes, 7, we're good, and everybody's like, cool, we're good, we all get $100. 
imagine now if I sort of seed the audience with people who try to create disagreement. So when I say, hey, seven, we're good, one of those jerks says, hey, nine, we good? And someone else says, yeah, let's go with nine, right? And they, they can sort of pollute the ordering process. The ordering process is not difficult. Everybody is aligned on wanting an answer, and there are objective tests for, like, including more transactions is good. You know, transactions that are invalid are not good. It, it, there are simple objective rules. The problem is that you may have those malicious adversaries uh, in there. And so you need something scarce that a malicious adversary can't have an unlimited amount of. And proof of work uses computing power as the something scarce. So an attacker who wants to attack Bitcoin's proof of work needs to get a lot of computing power to do it, and that's not easy or cheap. Proof of stake similarly uses value, and the native token is the thing that there's a scarcity of. The XRP ledger simply uses stakeholder chosen scarcity. That is, you simply choose something scarce. One thing we did to minimize the need for incentives and therefore their cost is to minimize the amount of operational power that any network participant has. So there are no unconfirmations, there's no reorganizations, there's nobody who gets to decide what transactions go in what block. So if you can't do a double spend through sort of reorganizing or unconfirming transactions and you can't censor, there really isn't much point to acquire large amounts of operational power. There's no real incentive to do it. In a system where you could do a double spend, you could imagine some somebody who gains a lot of operational power in the system because they know that they'll be able to exploit it. But if you can't exploit it, there's less incentive for anyone with dishonest intent to bother acquiring operational power. The next thing that we do is we subject operational power to objective rules. So unlike in most proof of work systems where you can include whatever valid transactions you want in the block, the code has objective rules for transaction inclusion. Um, there's no chance of invalid transactions ever being accepted because no honest participant would ever accept an invalid transaction. But similarly, um, you can avoid censorship this way by having a rule that says valid transactions received on time have to be included. Um, if a transaction is valid and it pays a sufficient fee, you cannot. the only way you can say that it shouldn't be included is if you didn't see it. And this is an important thing. Um, if you say you didn't see a transaction in round seven, you can't say you didn't see the transaction in round eight. Because by saying you didn't see it in round seven, you've seen it. What you really need to do is break ties among equally good ledgers or equally good transaction sets. But a transaction that in, it doesn't include a valid transaction that pays a sufficient fee and that also wasn't included in the previous round is not equally good to one that does. So by subjecting those operational powers to objective rules, you don't have to worry about almost everything that can go wrong. You limit the operational power as much as you can to just choosing between equally good ways of making forward progress. And you let stakeholders exclude bad actors. Stakeholders don't benefit from including bad actors, uh, and excluding an actor doesn't harm them. So you would be pissed if you were a Bitcoin miner and the Bitcoin ecosystem somehow stopped you from mining because it means you wouldn't get mining rewards. But if you're just helping the system decide between equally good ways to make forward progress, you wouldn't care if you were excluded because the system will still make forward progress in a way that's equally good. You haven't lost anything. No natural stakeholder cares which way the network makes forward progress. If Alice tries to send the same digital asset to both Bob and Charlie, she's a jerk. And we don't care whether it goes to Bob or whether it goes to Charlie or neither of them succeed. It's on Alice to make sure that she doesn't submit conflicting transactions. And if she does, all we need is that she not cause problems for good actors. We don't really care what happens to her. Natural stakeholders just care that double spends don't break the Bitcoin ecosystem. They don't care like who the Bitcoins go to. They just care that once somebody accepts a transaction, it's final. And good actors will accumulate. Natural stakeholders have no motive to exclude good actors. Again, natural stakeholders don't, don't care which of two equally good ways the system makes forward progress. They just want the system to make forward progress. If good actors make that system more reliable, then there's no reason for them to exclude them. But that's only because of the lack of artificial incentives. If you have proof of work or proof of stake, you actually have an incentive to exclude good actors. If I'm mining and I'm a good actor, other good actors are pushing up the difficulty in reducing the money I make. If I'm participating in a staking slashing system for block producer rewards, other people are sort of cutting into that pie of block producer rewards. So the incentive to prevent good actors from accumulating only comes from artificial incentives. If there aren't artificial incentives, good actors can and will accumulate. And they'll leave if they're not helping. If you're a miner and you're being paid money, even if you're making the network worse, you're still going to keep going because you're getting paid. If you're only mining because you want the network to be a better place, if you're not making the network a better place, you'll stop. 
So, so bad actors will be excluded and good actors will accumulate if and only if there are not these sort of artificial incentives and rewards. And so if you remove the incentive to attack the system because you can't double spend, you can't censor, you don't get paid, and you only get one shot and then you're excluded from the network because people will stop listening to you, there really is no incentive at all to attack the system. There's no point. This gives stakeholders what they want. They have minimal risk and minimal drama. The cost is low. They get maximum fairness and they get real operational decentralization because each individual good stakeholder who runs a full node is only relying on the system's incentive structure to break ties among equally good ways to make forward progress. If there's a way to make forward progress that's objectively better, all honest stakeholders will already agree to take the better way. If there's a way that's objectively worse, all honest stakeholders will agree not to take it. The only thing the honest stakeholders want is res resolution of the double spend problem among equally good transactions with minimal cost, drama, and fairness. It doesn't take millions of dollars in incentives to do that. In conclusion, artificial incentives centralize because the people who can take best take advantage of those incentives tend to look similar. They dilute the natural stakeholder's power because the natural stakeholders have to work through the artificial stakeholders who have different incentives. Artificial incentives are attacks on the nat natural stakeholders and they represent friction left in the system and they bring artificial stakeholders who come into the system because they want the artificial incentives and they want to maximize that friction to maximize their revenue. Natural incentives decentralize. The only reason to, per to participate in the system is because you want the system to work reliably. There is nothing for you to take from the system. You're not an artificial stakeholder trying to tax other participants. And the evidence shows that natural incentives are sufficient. If you don't artificially raise the cost and you, you keep the cost low, you don't need dramatic incentives. People run Bitcoin full nodes, which help the network to spread blocks and spread transactions because of natural incentives. The only reason mining is so much more expensive is because its people are competing for the rewards. It's expensive because it's rewarded. It's not rewarded because it's expensive. So what does this get you? It gets you low fees because you're not paying for proof of work. You're not paying people to lock up a volatile asset. It gets you fast confirmations because you know who the consensus participant set is. You don't have to worry about someone mining in secret who releases a larger block. So you don't have to defend yourself against uh, reorganizations. And it gets you real censorship resistance. There's no dictator of the moment. And that also means that you don't have to worry about whoever mines each block gaming the system. If you build a decentralized exchange, if you build a DeFi ecosystem, miners are your, are your primary threat because they can, they can test transactions at zero cost, find the transactions that most exploit the system and inject them, and they have no choice but to do it. And it's fine to say, okay, that's fine. That's, they're following the rules. That's part of how the system works. But that isn't good for the natural stakeholders. Remember, the natural stakeholders want a level playing field. Miners having this power to game the system is not a level playing field. It's not a disaster. It doesn't make the system useless or non-viable, but we should accept that it's a bad thing. So what did we use it for? We put in a built-in decentralized exchange because we knew that we didn't have dictators that could game it. We put in sophisticated payments with pathfinding, multiple assets, incremental execution. Um, we did that all in 2012 and early 2013. Uh, the XRP ledger has account management with managed multi-signing. Accounts are real things that have properties, so you can change the key on an account with, without changing your receiving address, which you can't do on most other systems. And we added payment channels for off-ledger scaling, so you can get much of the security of on-ledger payments with you know very, very high transaction per second rates because you're sort of giving someone a cryptographic receipt for funds that they can enforce on the ledger rather than performing a transaction on the ledger. Um, so if you want to check it out and see what we built and how it works, go to xrpl.org. Thank you.